It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Timiskaman and Cochrane. Speaker, my question. My question is to the Premier. Last week, Dr. Peter Juni, the science table head, called COVID right now in Ontario a tidal wave, a wave that's hitting our province hard. Public schools are being closed because there are not enough staff to keep them open. With the science table best data suggesting we've over 100,000 cases per day right now, that wasn't what the government predicted would happen. So why did the government remove the mask mandate for schools so early? To reply on behalf of the government, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. We have always taken a very cautious approach uh, when it comes to protecting the health and safety of the people of Ontario with COVID, and we have we were among one of the last provinces to lift the masking requirements. I think it needs to be said that Dr. Moore has uh, cautioned Ontarians for. Um, quite some time, that as we lifted the public health measures and with the increased transmissibility of the BA2 uh, strain of uh, COVID, that we were going to see the numbers go up. We are seeing the numbers going up. However, Dr. Moore has also indicated that because we have so many Ontarians that are now fully vaccinated, with the increased use of the antivirals such as Paxlovid we, uh, and the capacity in our hospitals, we are prepared to weather this and to continue. This is something that was entirely predictable from the beginning. We knew this was going to happen, and we're prepared Response. for it. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Public Health Ontario released some evidence last week. They state, quote, with expected increased infections among children associated with increased transmissibility of BA2, removal of public health measures, and limited vaccine eligibility and two-dose coverage in children less than 12 years, the number of children with severe disease is likely to increase. This may impact pediatric hospital and intensive care unit capacity and, has, and also lead to further disruption to in-person learning in Ontario." End quote. Speaker, Public Health Ontario is calling for bringing back the mask man mandate in schools, especially as schools are now closing. If the government won't do that, will the Premier and the Chief Medical Officer explain why not? Mr. Health. Well, as I've indicated before, the Chief Medical Officer of Health does not believe that that's necessary. We knew that the numbers were going to go up. But because, and I'll just quote Dr. Moore, we have tools that we did not have just two years ago, including highly effective vaccines that have changed the course of the pandemic, high vaccination rates that continue to improve as more and more Ontarians see the value of getting boosted to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. Thankfully, the people of Ontario have responded to the call for uh, higher levels of vaccination. We're seeing higher levels of vaccination in young people as well. And so while the numbers are increasing, we know that we have capacity in both our adult hospitals as well as our pediatric hospitals. The numbers have risen, risen slightly, even as the number of people with COVID increases. However, people Response. are not generally requiring hospitalization or requiring admission to intensive care units. And the final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaking of tools that were supposed to help uh, change the fight of, against COVID, a new investigative report by the Star found that rapid tests, as Premier said, would be a game change changer, didn't end up helping protect hotspot communities. In fact, the Premier sent 175,000 publicly paid for kits to private for profit schools. That's more than they sent to paramedics, child care centers, shelters, and other frontline services. Small businesses who could have deployed these tests to stay afloat weren't offered them, weren't offered what the Premier's friends got. Why weren't hotspot communities and frontline staff, why didn't they get these tests? Why weren't they at the front of the line? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and again, here, here it is the NDP, right? During the exact same time frame that the member is talking about, how many times did the NDP talk about rapid tests? Every 
Not once. Not one time, Order. Mr. Speaker. In Order. fact, this government has Order. sent out 150 Order. million rapid tests to the people of the province of Ontario, and now all of a sudden the NDP have come to the party, Mr. Speaker. Let me tell you, we were sending out those rapid Official tests opposition to schools. To we were sending out to Chambers of Commerce. The member for Peterborough ensured that Chambers of Commerce across the province had access to those tests for our small businesses, Mr. Speaker. We were sending them out to hot spots, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we were handing them out at subways, at shopping malls, Mr. Speaker. Order. We were doing everything that we could to get rapid the tests out. All of the time, we said how important it was. The Ontario Science Table said that we shouldn't do it. The Chief Medical Officer Spons. of Health said that they, we shouldn't do it, but we knew that we had to get those rapid tests out, Mr. Speaker, and to date, over 150 million of those rapid tests are out, more than the rest of the country combined, and we're very proud of that. The next question. Once again, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Seemed to have touched a nerve. The Speaker, to the, to the Premier. The Premier's high cost and low wage policies have hurt people looking to keep a roof over their heads. The cost of buying a house in Ontario has doubled since he was elected Premier, and for renters, the average cost up $192 a month. The Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation says affordable rent should be no more than 30% of your income. But if you live in Toronto this year alone, you'd have to work an extra seven and a half hours a month to stay, just to stay afloat. In London, it's an extra $15, 15 hours a month, and in Peterborough, it's a stunning 36 hours a month just to pay the extra rent. Why has the government done nothing to help Ontarians afford a safe roof over their heads? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I, I might want to ask the honourable member the same question. Why has his party done nothing in the last four years to support all of our initiatives that we've accomplished since being here? We know. We, we know there is much more work to do uh, collaboratively with our federal colleagues and with municipalities. But you know, I want to remind the honourable member that when it came to the fall economic statement in 2018, uh, when we, we adhered to our campaign promise to protect existing tenants uh, for rent control, uh, you know, it was it was his party, Speaker, who said there wouldn't be. Uh, you know any increase in purpose-built rental in the province, and, and what's happened? Three years later, we've now Order. seen record purpose-built rental being built in the province. Thirteen thousand purpose-built rental starts last year, the highest in 30 years. Speaker, through to the honourable member, why did your party keep voting no? Why did they keep not supporting all the members, all the all the initiatives? Are thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, especially up north, Ontarians have no choice to pay for the high prices, not just rent, but gas. Under this Premier's watch, gas prices are higher than ever. When this Premier was elected, gas in Ontario was 133 a litre, on average. The April average is now 174 a litre, and even higher up north. Order. That's 41 cents more a litre. So Order. 41 Order. cents. For a, pe for a person who has no choice but no choice okay. but to drive to work, Stop the clock. The member will take a seat. I need to be able to hear the member who's posing the question. Please restart the clock. Member for Commissioner Cochrane. For a person who has no choice but to drive to work, that's an extra $35 for every tank just to fill up the F-150. Speaker, this Premier promised in 2018 to, and I quote, have a frank discussion with the oil companies. End of quote, and said he'd be watching their every move, putting them on notice if they gouged consumers. But instead, he's let them gouge drivers every time they fuel up. Why has the Premier Question. sat back in his hands while gas prices shot up 41 cents a litre while he's been Premier? To reply, the government has well, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance recently brought a bill into this House that would lower uh, the gas tax for the people of the province of Ontario for every single person who drives, and not only for the people who drive, but everybody who relies on a product that is delivered to a store 
because of, uh, of fuel consumption, Mr. Speaker. And how did the NDP vote? They voted against that. They voted against putting more money in the pockets of people of the province of Ontario, more money in the pockets of small business people, Mr. Speaker. That's how the NDP voted. And we're not even talking about the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, a carbon tax that they fought for, Mr. Speaker. And after we eliminated the carbon tax in the province of Ontario and saw gas prices come down, Mr. Speaker, one, two, three, four, five cents, they fought to put it back onto the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And now, recently, we saw he talks about driving. Well, it was then, under their watch with the Liberals, that Response. they got rid of the Ontario Northland, making it even more difficult for people to get around the North. But it was this Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, this Premier, who brought it back. Under their watch, they closed things down. Under our watch, we unleashed the power of the Ontario economy. And the final supplementary. Every Ontarian knows buying food the prices are skyrocketing. When the Premier was elected, a Canadian family spent just, over, just under $1,000 a month on food. But these pro prices are projected to jump by 21% this year, or $3,000 more a year for a family of four, just to see, eat the same meals they always have. And it's not all supply chain issues, because one study found that food prices are up because of corporate profits. Why has this government ignored the high cost of living for Ontarians when it comes to putting food on the table and let companies get away with charging consumers so much? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you uh, to the member through you to the member opposite for that question, Mr. Speaker. You know, as the uh, the House Leader just highlighted, you know, this government has been working to reduce the costs uh, of living for uh, many Ontarians. And let me just highlight another area where we focused on putting more money back in the pockets of, of the people of Ontario. And in 2012, uh, as I note here, uh, the cost of the license plate sticker went from $82 to $90, Mr. Speaker. In 2013 to 14, it went up to $98. Mr. Speaker, who supported the Liberal government at that time? It was this member's yep. party that supported those increases. Yep. And then, Mr. Speaker, in 2014, the Minister of Transportation and the now leader of the Liberal Party increased it again, up to $108. And, Mr. Speaker, on 25th, September 1, 2016, again, up to $120. Mr. Speaker, that was this party supported by that party. We're putting more money in the pockets of the hardworking people of Ontario, and we have a lot more that we are going to do, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Well, that was quite a report in the Toronto Star this weekend. A bombshell investigative report confirmed that many of us, uh, what many of us already knew anecdotally, that the distribution of rapid antigen tests was anything but equitable, especially when it came to Ontario's schools. In the fall, as cases were rising and schools were closing yet again, Parents were forced to crowdsource rapid tests for their local public schools until this government, this government, Mr. Speaker, forbid them from doing that, saying they weren't recommended. I stood here in this House on October 5th and I asked the government, why are you stopping parents from sourcing those tests? And this government said they're not recommended, they're not necessary. Speaker, through you to the Premier, if those tests were not recommended, why was the government shoveling nearly 200,000 of them to private schools at the same time? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Now, you will recall at the time, Mr. Speaker, the, the Ontario Science Table uh, uh, did not recommend the distribution of the, of the rapid tests. The Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, did not recommend the distribution of, uh, of rapid tests, nor did Ontario Public Health. But you know what, and my colleagues will know this, despite those recommendations, we got over 50 million rapid tests out to education and child care centres, despite those recommendations, because we knew how important it is. Now, how many times did the Leader of the Opposition, colleagues, how many times did the Leader of the Opposition get up in her place and ask about rapid tests? Yeah. Not even one time, Order. not even one time. Welcome, welcome to the importance of rapid Order. tests. That is why we've got 150 million rapid tests out to the people of the province of Ontario. Thanks to the hard work of this Minister of Health, thanks to the hard work of this Premier, and thanks to the hard work of this caucus Response. that works every single day to ensure that all communities in this province were safe from COVID, Mr. Speaker, and that our schools were the safest in Canada. Here, here, here. 
supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, <laughs> despite all that, the Star report showed that private schools received more tests government side than government paramedics, order. than daycares, than shelters, and jails combined. Mr. Speaker, this government forced women's shelters to beg for rapid tests. You know, you told public schools, no, you don't get them yet. It's not necessary. And then worse still, over the 10 months after these publicly funded rapid tests were made available, only 20 per cent of them went to those COVID hotspots that were designated. They made schools. They made schools break down kits of five into two. Meanwhile, in August, in August, St. John's Kamarnock School got 14,000 rapid tests. Branksome Hall, where you have to pay $30,000, $36,000 a year to get your kid into that school, Question. they got 9,600 tests on August 26. And this government would not put those tests in the hands of our public school students, let alone our shelters, our jails, our paramedics. Mr. Speaker, knowing this, how can the Premier possibly justify a rapid test rollout that saw the wealthy and the well-connected get first dibs on an essential public health tool? Leader? Well, of course, Mr. Speaker, when the NDP think that they've got you, they start asking questions about it. One day they want masks, the next day they don't want masks. One day they want closures, closures, the next day they don't want closures. One minute they want more money in your pocket, but in the next minute they're voting to take Order. it out of your pocket. Where Order. was this member? Where was this party? Where was this leader of the opposition when we were distributing 150 million tests, including oh, yeah. over 50 million to our schools, to our child care centers? They were sitting Member on their Davenport hands. They didn't even talk order. about it. They never even knew about it. We had them at GO train stations. We sent every student home with a rapid test. And what did you do? Nothing. The member for Davenport come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke come to order. The next question is the member for Niagara West. Thank you much, Speaker. Uh, my question today is about Ontario's electricity supply, and it is to the Minister of Energy. The rapid growth of the greenhouse and automotive sectors in southwestern Ontario, under the leadership of Premier Ford, has been nothing short of remarkable. For 15 years, we watched the Liberals and NDP work together to drive good-paying manufacturing jobs out of this province. But under our government, we're bringing forward policies that ensure these jobs are coming back to our province, and we're working to make our energy grid more competitive. However, this record level of growth means that the demand for power is also greater than ever before. So my question to the Minister of Energy is what our government is doing to ensure southwest, southwestern Ontario's economic boom has access to the electricity it needs. Speaker, and uh, the member is absolutely correct. After years of seeing jobs and investment flee this province, we knew something needed to change. That's why we've been hard at work at restoring Ontario's clean energy advantage and providing the stability that job creators rely on. And we are seeing the results. Just a few weeks ago, our government announced the $5 billion Stellantis LGES wow. electric vehicle battery plant, which is the largest automotive investment in the history of this country, creating 2,500 jobs in the region. <laughs> but, Speaker, these jobs need power. And we need to be ready to support these job creators. That's why last week I announced that our government is taking action to facilitate the timely development of five new transmission lines in southwestern Ontario so that we can power southwestern Ontario's economic boom. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you very much uh, to the minister for that answer. And of course, we know that the nuts and bolts of Ontario's economic engine are energy. And we've had a fantastic track record when it comes to delivering on much needed reforms in the electricity sector to ensure that we have clean, green energy that's uh, produced for all of the growth that we're seeing across our region. Since our government first came to office, we've been working every day to make Ontario open for business and open for jobs. I know that Ontarians across Niagara and southwestern Ontario expect their government to understand 
understand that economic growth benefits everyone, and that by creating the conditions for new investments in our province, we are creating opportunities and prosperity for all. Could the member uh, speak a bit about how these transmission projects will enable even more investment and economic growth in Ontario? Member for and thank you again to the member for the question. With new projects often facing lengthy development times, we've taken action by declaring these transmission infrastructure projects as priorities to ensure we are meeting the needs of southwestern Ontario's economic boom. Our government knows that ensuring transmission capacity is built in a timely and efficient manner gives business confidence to expand or invest in operations and create new jobs. While these measures will create efficiencies, I do want to be clear that they do not remove the obligation of Hydro One to meet requirements of the Environmental Assessment Act. This will ensure each line is planned responsibly and in consultation with Indigenous and local communities. By working hand-in-hand -hand with job creators and communities, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we are enabling economic growth and more jobs for the people of southwestern Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. Omicron is spreading like wildfire. Two London schools closed last week because they couldn't even cover the absences. Thames Valley District School Board Chair Lori Pizzolato writes that 400 education positions remain unfilled every single day. That's 400 each day. 400. My constituent Mary wrote to the Premier and Minister Elliott, what are you doing to address this sixth wave of COVID-19 in Ontario? I don't want to hear about your hospital beds, which are very difficult to staff as more and more healthcare workers become infected every day. I want to hear how you're working to keep people out of those hospital beds, especially elders, children too young to be vaccinated, people with disabilities, immunocompromised people, people with cancer or with organ transplants, Indigenous peoples, people from underserved communities who have been hit the hardest. Speaker, why did this Question. government accept that children would be left unprotected when they made masks optional? and said safety was optional. Yeah. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you for the question. We have, every step along the way, taken every possible uh, step that we could take to make sure that the people, the health and well-being of the people of Ontario is protected. The best way to protect yourself is with a vaccination. We recognize that some can't be vaccinated yet, although there are some very promising developments uh, working their way through the system for approval. But we uh, recognize that we were going to see an increase in cases, but uh, that doesn't mean that people should, because we've dropped some of the public health measures, that doesn't mean that people should just ignore all of the other benefits, that there, the precautions that should be taken. Wearing a mask, of course, is optional now. It's not mandatory but it's up to every person to assess their own level of risk and so we are recommending of course that people continue to wear masks in crowded public Response. spaces like public transit and so on continuing with the usual measures of mask wearing frequent hand washing and all the rest it's not mandatory but it is something that everybody needs to assess under their own personal circumstances to determine whether a mask continues to be in their best interest the supplementary question Respectfully, Speaker, masks are tools, tools this government has left gathering dust on the table. Children need help assessing risk. They need, they need direction from this government. They need leadership. The science table, back to the Premier. The science table, kids, sick kids hospital, and numerous school boards fought for masks to continue so kids would stay safe in school. But leading experts were undermined by this government, whose reckless, politically motivated decision made masks optional in schools. Speaker, this government ignored science, ignored their own expert table, and threw caution into the wind when they should be protecting children. My constituent, Kathy, wrote me a letter urging me to help the government understand the change to their previous decision regarding masks is all about protecting us and keeping us to stay healthy. When will the Premier call the Chief Medical Officer of Health and make him answer the growing number of parents who want their kids to stay safe? Will the Premier and the Chief Medical Officer of Health answer the growing flood of parents and families who are terrified Question. about the dangerous amount of illness in our schools? Yes or no? The Minister of Health. Every decision our government has made since the beginning of this pandemic has been based on clinical evidence, based on science, based on recommendations from Dr. Moore, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, and his advisors. 
This has been the course that we have always taken and the course that we will continue to take. With respect to the overall view of whether masking should be mandatory or optional at this point, as Dr. Moore has said on a number of occasions, we are at the stage now where we need to learn to live with COVID. We're not going to eliminate it in the next short while. We will still have cases, but it's important that people continue to be vaccinated. We have increasing numbers of antivirals that are coming into the province. Dr. Moore is going to be speaking about that this afternoon, and we do have capacity in our hospitals. But we know that people will are following these measures. Response. We are making these recommendations based on what Dr. Moore and the epidemiologists have told us. We have always done that in the past, and we will continue to do that in the future. Next question, member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. After being kept under wraps by the Premier for more than a month, Dr. Moore is giving a briefing today. And here's what we've known for a few weeks. We're at 100,000 cases a day. So the sixth wave is a tidal wave. People who need Paxlovid, they can't get it. And vaccination rates installed, which is leaving way too many people unprotected. There is no plan for testing. Local medical officers of health, Public Health Ontario, the science table has called for masking indoors. Yet this government is still planning to lift masking mandates in long-term care, hospitals and public transit on April 27th. So, Speaker, will the government do the right thing and not remove masking in LTC homes and hospitals and public transit? And also return today to require masks in essential settings like schools. Thank you. The Minister of Health. As I've just indicated, our government is going to continue to follow the recommendations made by Dr. Moore and his colleagues with respect to masking, with respect to taking of antivirals. Dr. Moore himself is going to be available for questions and to discuss the uh, increasing use of the pack of Paxlovid and other antivirals, both in terms of eligibility and availability, because we are receiving larger quantities now, and we know that there are many more people that will want to take these antivirals to avoid avoid having to go into hospital, to avoid having to be in intensive care. So uh, any questions with respect to those issues can be put to Dr. Moore. He is going to make himself available, and we continue to follow his advice and guidance. The supplementary. So there's a six-year-old at CHEO in Ottawa, and he has uh, something called orbital cellulitis and had some other symptoms. We don't know what it is. That's our grandson. And he's not the only one in the province who's in hospital that's a child, or anyone across the province. And we know that lifting the masking mandates has created greater spread. We, it's not anecdotal. Public Health Ontario has told us. The science table has told us. Right. So last week in Ottawa, all the hospitals and all the medical officers that help in the area said, we need to return to mask mandates. They called for return to mask mandates. So my question is really simple, really simple. Will the Chief Medical Officer of Health allow local public health units to issue masking requirements in their own communities? Will he do that? A Section 22 isn't good enough. Question. You know the restrictions that are with that. He, they should be order, able to order a letter of instruction. It's either that or Dr. Moore has to do it. Thank you, Speaker. Ask members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Well, first, let me say I'm very sorry to hear about your grandchild, and I hope that he will be well. Um, secondly, with respect to the wearing of masks, uh, as Dr. Moore has indicated in the past, it's who we need to learn to live with COVID. That said, it is, uh, it's not compulsory anymore, but every person has to do their own risk assessment. Many people are choosing to continue to wear their masks, and they don't feel comfortable not wearing them in crowded public spaces. With respect to what's going to be happening in hospitals and long-term care homes and other places where there's higher risk, that's something that we are constantly assessing with Dr. Moore's guidance and the guidance of the other epidemiologists who are advising him. And uh, that will be up to, we are waiting, Dr. Moore's recommendations. 
But as I said before, many people are Response. choosing to continue to wear their masks. That is their own preference. And the local medical officers of health, I know, are conferring on a regular basis with Dr. Moore as well. So that is something that we will await their guidance on. And if it's a requirement that uh, they recommend that we return to mask wearing, we will. But it will be based on the. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Over the past week, there has been some exciting news for Northern Ontario. Announcements have been made that would secure the economic future for the North and provide them with the critical infrastructure to remain prosperous for years to come. Can the minister please provide an update to this House on how the government is supporting good jobs in Northern Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, 10 years ago, the previous Liberal government, only with a hand from the NDP, gutted Northern Ontario by putting Ontario Northland Railway up for sale and cancelling the Northlander train service. Well, that all changed Order. now. For several years, our government has been funding the plans for the return of passenger rail, and yesterday, Premier Ford, Minister Mulroney announced $75 million to bring our train back. This funding will replace the tracks and stations that are needed, as well as provide the passenger rail cars. Ten years ago, the union leaders called it the darkest Order. day at ONTC. Well, the sun is shining today on a bright, new and hope-filled future to, thanks to our government returning Response. passenger rail to our north. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Minister. It's great to hear that our government is supporting the workers and jobs for people all across the province, including the North. Our government understands the importance of regional economic development, and announcements like these show our commitment to local communities in Ontario. Back to the Minister. Can the Minister please inform this House how else we are supporting people in the North? Minister of Economic Development. Ten years ago, when the Liberals announced that they were selling off Ontario Northland, the NDP did not stand up to support the North. They sat on their hands. So the Liberals, with the NDP support, dealt the very first blow to Ontario Northland. They shipped 100 GO Train cars to Quebec to be refurbished. They knew there was no way they could shut down Ontario Northland if they were given that valuable contract, the one they'd held for years, Speaker. And to add insult to injury, it cost more taxpayer dollars to ship those rail cars to Quebec to have them done. Well, that changed on Friday, Speaker. The province announced a $109 million contract to refurbish 56 GO Transit rail coaches in North Bay. That's work for 100 women and men in North Bay for three years and vindication Response. for those hard-working teams at Ontario Northland. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, this week is the one-year anniversary of massive cuts to Laurentian University's programs and staff. The parliamentary assistant asked me when I was going to stand up for the North every single day for the last four years. <laughs> Speaker, it's been one year since hundreds of Siberians were fired without severance, without notice. It's been one year since these workers had to tell their families this devastating news. It's been one year since the students learned that their programs have been eliminated. It's been a year since the Minister of Francophone Affairs has neglected our region regarding the French Language Services Act. A process that was never intended for a university created a black box of secrecy that continues to this day to devastate my community. It's been one year of waiting for hope and being ignored from the parliamentary assistant, waiting to begin to rebuild. Speaker, one year ago, the Premier failed to provide the funding needed to avoid the process that led to these devastating cuts at Laurentian University. Will the Premier finally end the chaos of the CCA process and protect what remains at Laurentian University and provide the funds to help rebuild it. Great. That's good. 
Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. And uh, you know, I had the opportunity to meet with the member as well as the member from Nickel Belt to uh, discuss the situation at Laurentian, which we are obviously it's a priority for, for all of us to ensure that there's successful post-secondary education in the north. And that's why this government stepped forward on December 16th and uh, took over the DIP loan uh, for the the university. That was a $35 million loan that the university has. We also took uh, additional measures to uh, provide cost-saving measures by providing a $6 million COVID grant for Laurentian University and the suspension of uh, recovers and reduction, reductions, including those linked to enrollment targets. My priority as the Minister of Colleges and Universities is to ensure success for the students at Laurentian University, which is why this government stepped forward with financial assistance of up to $4,000 to students who needed to transfer to publicly assisted uh, post-secondary institutions where their uh, programs were cut Response. in these situations. We will continue to work with the Laurentian University, the board and administration to ensure success. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member for Nickel Belt. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Also to the Minister of College and University. Laurentian University is a world-class institution, in part because it is surrounded by freshwater lakes, conversation, conservation lands, cross-country and hiking trails, world-class green spaces. At Laurent any Laurentian University students or community member can tell you the added value of the green space to their quality of life and to their education. 15 local organizations, including HSN's physician, all four school boards have written to the minister. As the debtor in procession, the government has the right to Laurentian's property. The government has to agree and can oppose the sale of any of Laurentian University assets, including its green space. Can the government reassure my community now by making it clear Question. that they will use their powers as dip lender to oppose and st stop the sale of any green space at Laurentian University? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. And I know Laurentian University is a priority for you in your community, um, as the government uh, understands as well. It's a, uh, you know, a post-secondary education uh, in the, the north that is uh, very important not only to the community, to the local labour needs, but also to the local sectors in the, the um, north that offers some remarkable program. programming. As I said, my priority uh, at this time is to monitor the process uh, with the CCAA that the university is going through right now, but to ensure that there's support given for the students and that um, students are uh, supported during this difficult time. I did have the opportunity to meet with some students and discuss the, the situation. I know it has been difficult um, on students uh, as well as the community, but we'll continue to monitor, to work with the uh, Laurentian University um, the faculty, staff, uh, administration, uh, the board to, Response. Uh, as we work through the CCAA process um, and the, you know, the work that the government has done to, to step in and uh, help move forward. Thank you. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last spring and summer, every health leader, every teachers' union, every school board, every parent was begging the government for a safe back-to-school plan uh, in the fall. When that plan eventually came late in the summer, it was lackluster. There was no rapid testing for anyone in, in public schools. The rollout for vaccines for teenagers was slow because they didn't use schools as vaccination centers. There was almost a late rollout for, for uh, younger age children, as you know, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as a result, the fall was interrupted with uh, vaccine or with uh, COVID exposures, missed class both for teachers and for students, and uh, a very disruptive uh, session. As it turns out, Mr. Speaker, there was money available for rapid testing—175,000 rapid tests to private schools, Mr. Speaker. While parents of public age, public school children were forced to buy their own and spend hundreds of dollars, but or go without. Why did this government choose to prioritize kids in public school? over the millions of Ontarians that send their kids to public school, Mr. Speaker. The government house leader. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Party. You know, what can you say about the Liberal Party? They do one thing when the cameras are on and another when the cameras are off, right? We've seen this from them before. So when the cameras are on, mainly in the legislature now, they mask up. But when nobody's watching, mainly at a Liberal convention, all crowd around the leader, no masks on. The next day they say that we have to wear masks. Then they say that we shouldn't wear masks, open, close. It's all, they're all over the place, Mr. Speaker, all over the place. 
Now, when we were shipping 150 million rapid tests throughout the province of Ontario, what were they doing? Nothing, Mr. Speaker. As a matter of fact, the Liberals' handpicked candidate, Dr. Nathan Stahl, what did he say about, the, about uh, rapid tests? Well, he said testing with rapid antigen testing is not recommended. The Liberal medical advisor, the candidate in St. Paul's, it's not recommended. He went even further. We don't have evidence to support. And the risks are Messiah high, Mr. Speaker. Order. So what is it, Mr. Speaker? Oops. Is it the Liberals' handpicked medical officer advisor? Spots. Or is it not, Mr. Speaker? They can't even agree amongst themselves on the appropriate path. Thankfully, a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority government is getting Ontario through it better than any other jurisdiction. Supplementary question, the member for Ottawa South. Well, the Premier, the Premier called Carter. rapid test game changers. But, and he managed to send the game changers to private schools, but not to public schools. But since the member brought up masking, here's the point I was trying to make, trying to get across. Right? Order. It's not funny. It's actually not funny. Order. Right? In hospitals across Ontario right now, there is a crisis because of absenteeism. And you all know it. We all know it. The hospitals tell us. And that's why we should be masking. That's why we should be worried about everyone who's in hospital that they, they're able to have the people they need to be there to care for them. And we can joke about all this stuff, and we can point fingers and quote things, but at the end of the day, right now, we need to go back to masking, keep it in LTC, keep it in hospitals, keep it in public transit, and for God's sakes, do it in schools and places where people have to go. Question. Because you know why? People are getting sick, people are absent for work, and there's going to be a state where people aren't going to get the care that they need, and you know it. So please do it. Thank you. Ask the members to make their comments through the chair. The Government House Leader to reply. And under the 15 years that he had the opportunity to govern, then we wouldn't have had the lack of ICU capacity in this province. We wouldn't have had the health and human resource issues that we're having in this province. We wouldn't have had old, outdated hospitals that need to be rebuilt. Had only he had the passion then, we wouldn't have went into a warehouse of PPE that was expired, Mr. Speaker. That is the record of the Liberal Party. That is the record that saw us have to endure lockout, lockdowns longer than any other jurisdiction because they did Order. not prepare the province of Ontario. Order. However, Mr. Speaker, because of a strong, strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority, we are making PPE right here in the province of Ontario. We have 90 percent of our population vaccinated, Mr. Speaker. We have the safest return to school program in North America. We are building long-term care homes. They built 611 homes. There's more than that being built in my own riding, Mr. Speaker, and in his community. 30,000, Mr. Speaker. Had only they had passion for anything, we wouldn't have been where we are now, Mr. Speaker, but we're getting through it better than any other jurisdiction because of the hard work. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Glanville. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Minister, last week you were joined by the President of the Treasury Board Secretariat to share a message with Ontarians about what our government is doing to ensure that they have the PPE needed to keep them safe. Speaker, after two difficult years, Ontarians want reassurance. Their government is doing what is necessary to ensure we never let our guard down when it comes to public health. And as such, Speaker, I'd like to ask the minister what measures his ministry and our government are taking to secure the future of Ontario's health and safety. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Flamborough-Glanbrook uh, uh, for, uh, for her question. Uh, last Wednesday, I had the privilege, uh, Mr. Speaker, of uh, uh, joining our uh, President of the Treasury Board and uh, visiting a ho uh, one of our warehouses uh, in, in the city of uh, or my apologies, visiting a warehouse, and it was under the Personal Protective Equipment and Supply and Protection Act, uh, which is the first piece of legislation of its kind. And through that act, uh, Mr. Speaker, our government is ensuring that we have a very robust and healthy stockpile of PPE 
and critical supplies that are available at all times and that we are always ready to tackle any future emergency that we may face. Unlike the previous Liberal government who left behind a hollowed out stockpile, Mr. Speaker, of our critical emergency supplies, warehouses like the one that the President of the Treasury Board and I visited last week Response. stood empty and quiet. To this failure, Premier Ford and myself and our entire government have one thing to say, Mr. Speaker, and that is never again. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. COVID-19 has taught us many different lessons, including how we can better prepare for any future threats to public health and safety. Even more so, as the government house leader has so passionately argued, we've learned what not to do when it comes to being prepared, thanks to the previous Liberal government and their NDP allies who are responsible for the sorry state of our PPE stockpile when the pandemic first struck. My question through you, Speaker, is again for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Now more than ever, Ontarians are looking for leadership and confidence in our ability to protect public health for now and in the future. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister, how is our government setting the stage to ensure that Ontarians can continue to feel safe and confident when it comes to our PPE supply and domestic production capability? Thank you again, uh, Mr. Speaker, and again to the member uh, for her question and for her outstanding advocacy for the people of Flamborough. Uh, Speaker, under Premier Ford's leadership, we have been working relentlessly behind the scenes to boost the supply of our PPE and our critical supplies exponentially. Under this new piece of legislation, it is a bold step in ensuring a plan to protect Ontarians, to ensure that we can stay open, and to ensure that that continues to be a reality. We're ensuring that we have a robust stockpile by harnessing our domestic production, strengthening our supply chain and our source of critical materials. In fact, over the next 18 months, over 93%, that's 93% of all of our procurements of PPE are coming from Ontario and Canadian-based manufacturers. We're doing this openly. We're doing it transparently, without the veil of secrecy that plagued the former, former Liberal government. Response? This is going to bring much-needed transparency and trust to Ontarians in their government and let them know that they can rest assured, be rest assured that our stockpile is full and in good condition. Next question, the member for Waterloo. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, and my question is to the Premier. Over the weekend, we did learn through the Freedom of Information report via the Toronto Star that this provincial government was giving preferential treatment to private schools over public schools when it comes to access to rapid antigen tests. In Waterloo Region, for instance, one private school received 14,000 free rapid antigen tests from the government last fall. That's enough rapid antigen tests to screen their students twice weekly through to Christmas break. Now, Christmas break, Mr. Speaker, is when the government finally got around to giving four rapid antigen tests per family to, uh, pu for, to families across this province. That was, that was the state of affairs right there. Um, meanwhile, when I reached out on behalf of countless constituents that were struggling to find these tests before Christmas, the Ministry of Health wrote in a letter to me that there were limited supply of tests. Question. Direct quote, I'll send it over. So they had the tests. Mr. Speaker, why didn't the government of Ontario allocate sufficient rapid antigen tests to public schools, to libraries, to daycares, to anyone who needed them so that they can actually screen themselves for COVID and prevent the transmission of COVID? What's actually quite shameful, Mr. Speaker, is that the opposition are now suggesting that if you happen to send your kids to a private school, somehow you don't deserve to get the same treatment as the kids in our public school. Now here, Mr. Speaker, is the difference. Here's the difference. Not only did our private schools get it, but so too did 50 million other people in the province of Ontario in education and childcare. In fact, we are the only Order. province that sent home rapid tests Order. with kids over the holidays, Mr. Speaker. The only province to do that. And on every single occasion, they either said nothing or did nothing to assist, Mr. Speaker. 150 million rapid tests went out across the province. And you know who else got rapid Opposition tests, Mr. Come Speaker? To order. Our small businesses in her own community got rapid tests, Mr. Speaker. That's who got uh, rapid tests. Education, health care, uh, essential, uh, essential uh, industries, Mr. Speaker. Over 150 Response. million tests, more than any other province. 
In fact, Mr. Speaker, more than all of the other provinces combined. It is a great record, and we should be proud of that. I know we are on the side of the house. So I would just say uh, that facts matter in this regard. On this side of the House, we were asking day in and day out why ECEs did not have access to tests, why public schools did not have access to tests, why, why when people had to line up at the LCBO, they were gone in 20 minutes. But certain people had easy access. We're asking for equal access. And, and, and that answer that the minister just gave is completely insufficient. Uh, but we do know that rapid, rapid antigen tests would have helped curb the amount of absenteeism we are currently seeing in Waterloo Region public schools and in schools across the province because of a surge in sickness due to COVID-19. This past week, for instance, this was the worst week for Waterloo Region district school boards in terms of fail to fills, with 90 fail to fills across 16 secondary schools. This impacts learning. You should care about that. Spread, COVID spread in our schools Question. impacts the overall community. People should not have to scramble to find staff to staff our schools. Why did this government fail to ensure that public schools would have had sufficient access to rapid antigen tests and equal access? That's what we want to know. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, it is under our Premier's leadership that we are sending 7 million rapid tests to publicly funded schools every single month, 40,000 additional HEPA units to our publicly funded schools, 9,000 additional HEPA units to our child care centres. Mr. Speaker, we continue to provide free PP. We're the only jurisdiction in this federation to send N95s to child care and education staff well before the members opposite raised this issue. Mr. Speaker, we have over 200 school-based vaccination clinics in the province of Ontario. We were the only province, as the House Leader rightfully said, to send millions of rapid tests home over Christmas, the only province to have the foresight to do so ahead of Omicron hitting our shores, the only jurisdiction in Canada to send families home with take-home PCR tests. This was a proactive plan designed to reduce risk to keep to kids order. learning in school, which Response. this government and our progressive conservative government understands is so consequential to the mental health of children. We're going to continue to invest with $300 million for more staff, more PPE, more rapid tests to keep our kids safe. Speaker. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you. Uh, speaker, my question is to the Premier. Last week, the Financial Accountability Officer of Ontario released its report comparing Ontario's fiscal results with the other provinces after the first year of the pandemic. Despite Ontario's tax revenue being 13.7 per cent of GDP, which was higher than the average of other provinces, Ontarians are not seeing that translate into its programs and services. In fact, the FAO reports that when it comes to health spending, Ontario is last. In fact, they found that the health spending is 10 per cent below the average of other provinces. It is alarming that this government has consistently underspent when it comes to health care, starting with cutting $284 million in planned cuts to public health pre-pandemic. So, Speaker, why does this Premier feel that Ontarians should be paying their taxes but not getting the same results in health spending? Minister of Finance. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member opposite for that question. Uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, I, I sit here and listen to, to the member opposite talk about uh, investments in health care when the previous government, supported by the NDP from 2011 to 2014, order. clearly, clearly did not member make for Niagara Falls come to order. Member for Waterloo come to order. For health care, for long-term care, for housing, for high-speed internet, for highways, for public transit. So, Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what this government is doing. In, during the pandemic, $51 billion in supports were made available to fight COVID-19 and to support and promote the economic recovery. In fact, since the finan uh, financial economic update that I tabled here on November 4th, we put in additional $2.3 billion to support our health care system, Mr. Speaker. That side of the House didn't invest in infrastructure and health care. This side of the House is. The supplementary question. Because I have a lot to say. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. You know, when it comes to taking a deep dive into the FAO's numbers and comparing where Ontario ranks in its per capita spending in 2020, 
based on its program spending with other provinces, we are not number one in any category in Canada. In fact, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to general public service, we are last. When it comes to health care, we are last. When it comes to housing and community services, we are last. When it comes to recreation and culture, it, we are last. When it comes to the environmental protections that we Mr. need Mr. for the future of this province, Mr. Speaker, we are 9 out of 10, but we are nowhere leading the pack. So, my question, Mr. Speaker, question. that it is clear that this government does not want to in invest in Ontario's future. Will the Premier, con will the Premier continue on his programs of lack of investments, or will he invest in the future of this province? Minister Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's interesting that the member opposite talks about being last. I'll let uh, others uh, draw their own conclusion for the few members over there. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, let, let's look at some of the facts, Mr. Speaker. Uh, which part, which side of the house didn't go out in front of the public every 90 days to tell the people of Ontario how they spent their money? That side of the house. Which side of the house came out 16 quarters in a row over the last four years to tell the people of Ontario how they were spending their money? This side of the house. Which side of the House did not get a clean opinion from the Auditor General for the Public Accounts? Oops. That side of the House. Which side of the House for four straight years has got a clean public opinion from the Auditor General? This side of the House. Which side of the House put tolls on the 412 and the 14, 418, making it more expensive for the people of Durham Region, where uh, I represent, Mr. Speaker, that side of the House? Which side of the House is providing support for the families of not just Dern, all around Ontario, so the cost of living continues to be supported by this government? Order. This is the government that says, yes, this is the government that's getting it done. Sure. The next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Youth unemployment numbers across the province, and in particular, in my riding of York Southwestern, are um, troublesome. While we are still feeling the economic effect of the pandemic, a clear strategy and youth unemployment initiative needs to be in place. I recently had the pleasure of having some meetings with the First Work Ontario's Youth Employment Network. First Work uh, programs a vital service in providing a range of employment services. This government changed the delivery model from the uh, Children, Community and Social Services to the Ministry of Labour in 2019. We are seeing the effect of that change uh, with its scarce public dollars, I'm concerned about the use for profit service providers with the cutting of the programs that really help those most uh, at risk and vulnerable young people. What is this government doing to ensure an employment model remains well funded and a strategic youth employment plan is in place? Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I think uh, uh, the member knows full well that uh, when we came to office in, in 2018, many of the programs to support people who were looking for, uh, for work just weren't working for the very same people who were seeking to access that work. That is why we modified the system entirely to make it more of a results-based uh, system. We looked at those best providers, Mr. Speaker. We supported them so that people in the community could have access to jobs. Now, the good news is this, Mr. Speaker. Not only are we looking uh, for people who are in the workplace today, that's why you know, 550,000 people, I believe, have the dignity of a job that did it when we took office in 2018. But for those young people, the people on his youth council, they have to look forward to a system of education that is better. There are more schools that are open. We have a better curriculum because of this Minister of Education. Our colleges and universities are firing on all cylinders. Preparing people for the jobs of tomorrow, the Minister of Labour has ensured that skilled training and the trades are back, are back in the Response. province of Ontario. Before you could not get a skilled trade in this province, now you can. And the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade has delivered the jobs of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, and that is what the youth of this province have to look forward to under a stable, strong, conservative majority government. Thank you. Uh, uh, back to, to the Premier. I'm honoured to have guests in the public gallery this morning from our York Southwestern Youth Council. Uh, they know firsthand the struggles young people face and know that a very important service was lost in the government's changes of delivery, and that is through the Youth Job Connection Program. This program assisted those young workers that really needed the most assistance and have pushed them into the hard-to-navigate and intimidating adult system. 
This policy shift and overhaul of social services is being piloted in three test regions. Young people have already been hit by the pandemic economic damage, and young people facing many barriers are now being neglected by this government. Will this government look to youth employment services that raise up all young people reject them for profit models and devote their energy to helping those most vulnerable youth. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. What the Minister of Labour has been focusing on right from the beginning is ensuring that the youth, the people who will fill the jobs of tomorrow, have access to programs that, wait for it, actually work. Yep. Because the system that we inherited from the Liberals was not working for the very same young people who are in the gallery today who were looking for jobs, Mr. Speaker. It was not working. Our education system had let them down. Our colleges and universities had let them down. A system of, uh, of, uh, of training had let them down. Apprenticeship was almost closed in the province of Ontario because of the policies of the Liberals supported by the NDP. Now, we reignited the Ontario economy right from day one, Mr. Speaker, building for the jobs of tomorrow. The jobs of tomorrow, that is what we have been doing since day one, so that the members of your Youth Council, those who are sitting in the gallery, have access to the highest paying jobs that we can offer. Response. And that is why when we deliver $5 billion for new technologies in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and the thousands of jobs come with it, it is not for us, it is for tomorrow that we do it. And I hope the member will support us on that journey. The next question, the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. To you, to the uh, Minister of Health. You know, the creation of a vaccine usually requires 10 to 15 years of research before the vaccine is made available to the general public, which includes several years of identifying an antigen that can prevent a disease. Now, many Ontarians chose not to get vaccinated because of a lack of reliable clinical data related to adverse side effects. Now, extensive trials are conducted on human volunteers to test vaccine efficacy to determine appropriate dosage and to monitor adverse side effects. Dr. Moore has stated we have to learn to live with COVID, and I agree, just like we have to learn to live with the cold or flu virus. It's been proven that with every shot, one's immune system is further depleted, leaving people with greater susceptibility to other illnesses. Now new science data has come forward. Pfizer was court ordered, uh, Speaker, to reveal what they knew all along, thousands of adverse effects. So, Minister, you and the science table were misled. So what do you say now that new data has come forward? And to respond on behalf of the government, the government host leader. Speaker, I, I, honestly, the question speaks for itself, doesn't it? Like, we, we could reevaluate uh, 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 15, 20, 30 years, and the member opposite still would not believe in the effect, efficacy of, uh, of the vaccine, Mr. Speaker. We could let it go for 100 years. He would still be getting up in his place and saying, and people like him saying, that vaccines do not work. They do, Mr. Speaker. That is why billions upon billions of people worldwide have gotten a vaccine. That is why in Ontario, the 90 per cent of Ontarians who have gotten access to a vaccine, Mr. Speaker, and we have seen the results. Our economy is coming back, Mr. Speaker. We are on fire yet again, Mr. Speaker, because of the work of our health care professionals, because of vaccines. So look, I completely disagree with the member opposite. He has the right to get in his place and ask these questions. But I completely disagree with him, Mr. Response. Speaker, and so do 90 per cent of the people of the province of Ontario who have rolled up their sleeves and got vaccinated. That concludes our question period for this morning. The member for Orléans has a point of order he wishes to raise. Just, Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, I'd like to uh, correct my record uh, during my question. I said that the government prioritized public schools when, of course, they prioritized private schools over public schools. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. It is a valid point of order to rise and correct your own record. Thank you. Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 103, an act to amend the Insurance Act to prevent discrimination with respect to automobile insurance rates in the Greater Toronto Area. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bill.